Yes, all right, new high score, excellent. Oh, oh my goodness, it's, it's time for the live. Oh, hold on a moment here. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining me for another episode of Home of the World's Worst Weather Live. My name is Ian Bailey, I'm a meteorologist and education specialist, and I'm part of a crew of six observers that live and work here on the summit, taking hourly weather observations, putting out forecast products, and doing research from the top of New England. So this is Monday, another edition of our Monday broadcast. We'll be taking a deep dive look into lightning and lightning safety today. I'm very excited to talk about this. But before we dive in, let's go ahead and take a look at some of our current summit conditions and briefly talk about what's happening outside. So it's actually kind of an interesting day so far. We spent most of the morning in the fog and only in the, just in like the last hour or so did we finally break out into decent visibility and blue skies. You'll see in just a second. We have relatively calm wind speeds right now, so we're hanging around around 27 miles per hour, so that's actually fairly low. Uh, usually we expect winds upwards in the 30 to 45 mile per hour range on average, so a little less than that currently. Our temperatures are on the rise, so we were starting off in like the lower 20s this morning, and we're rapidly approaching the 30 degree mark, so we'll see if we'll be able to cross over that throughout the day. Uh, and as you can see, up until recently, again, our visibility was pretty low. We were sitting in the fog, uh, and it was only letting us see most of the way across the observation deck, maybe about 75 feet or so, until we broke out probably about 20 to 30 minutes ago. Taking a look at the vertical temperature profile again, you can see this is from our Mesonet, a series of weather stations that go from the summit of Mount Washington all the way back down to the base, recording things like temperature and wind speed. And you can see we have a pretty normal profile going on here. Temperatures are decreasing with height as you go up, but the lower two-thirds of the mountain is very much above freezing in the 40s and even down into the 50s at the base. But up here, we're only just now starting to approach the freezing line. So we'll see again if we are able to warm up to freezing and beyond. It will depend on how much longer we're in the clear here. So let's take a look and see what's happening outside. This is a webcam that looks from our observation tower down across the deck. And you can actually see we have broken out. You can see a lot of the snow that we got from this past weekend. So we actually ended up getting about a foot of snow uh, with that nor'easter that moved through. And a lot of that is still blanketing the deck and even on the sides of the camera here. Um, but then we have decent visibility and we have multiple cloud layers above us. Uh, we're not expecting to stay in the clear for terribly long. We'll probably be back in the fog by the end of the day. Uh, but we are enjoying a little bit of sunshine and clear skies right now. And just so you can see, this is what our sunrise looked like this morning. So you can see that really thick fog bank sitting right on top of us. And there it does start to clear above us. And you'll even see we do clear out a little bit in the early hours when we first started our shift today. Uh, and then there were periods where we go right back into the fog. So here we are hanging out in the fog and then it's dissipating a little bit. You can even see the observatory for just a couple of seconds in this video before the fog bank reforms. And again, this was occurring just up until about 20 to 30 minutes ago when we came back into the clear and we'll see how long that lasts. So that's what's happening up here on the summit currently. Today though, we're gonna talk about unstable weather. So no blue sky, no fair weather conditions. We're gonna talk about lightning and in particular what lightning is, how it works, how it's formed and then a little bit about lightning safety as well. So let's go ahead and dive into our topic for today. Let me go ahead and zoom in so you guys can see a little bit clearer. There we go, perfect. So what is lightning? Lightning essentially is a giant spark of electricity, like a giant electrical discharge that moves through the atmosphere and typically originates from a thunderstorm, whether it's one that's already formed or one that is building throughout its life cycle. Now, lightning is a fascinating and beautiful thing to observe, but it also is pretty dangerous and it happens quite frequently in the United States. We see on average about 20 to 25 million lightning strikes across the United States each year, which is crazy. We are known for our severe weather and of course lightning is going to be a part of that across most of the parts of the United States. And it is again pretty dangerous and a really impressive thing to witness. Lightning can heat the air around it during that instant of a lightning strike up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And for reference, that's about five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Now it happens instantaneously, and we'll talk about what happens as a result of a lightning strike and that incredible heating of the air, but that's just impressive to try to even imagine what something five times hotter than the surface of the sun might feel like. So that's pretty crazy. And another crazy fact is that it can strike at upwards of 200 million miles per hour. And we know lightning happens in the blink of an eye instantaneously, but just to try to put a speed to how fast that lightning strike is moving, 200 million miles per hour, which is absolutely incredible. So we talked about how it heats the air around it. I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see this picture a little bit better. So what happens as a result of that incredible heating of the air and to help clear the air on some things, what is the relationship between lightning and thunder? So lightning heats the air super hot in that incredible instant. When it does heat it, the air expands incredibly rapidly in the area of the lightning strike. But because it only happens for an instant, as soon as the lightning bolt dissipates, the air then cools 
really rapidly. So this kind of creates like a reverberation, kind of like a rumbling, and this is the thunder that we hear, is that back and forth movement of the sound wave. Now from the point of the lightning strike, that rumbling thunder will actually move outwards at the speed of sound, which is really, really fast. Not nearly as fast as the speed of light, but fast enough where that sound wave can travel pretty impressively far away, up to 10 miles or more in some cases, and it just so happens that at the speed at which that thunder sound moves, we can actually measure distance as a result. So thunder can move about a mile over a period of five seconds or so. So when you see lightning and you start counting, you can actually figure out how far away that lightning strike was based on how long it takes you to hear the thunder. So let's say, for example, it moves and you hear it, you see lightning flash, and then you hear it 15 seconds later, that means that lightning had struck about three miles away from you. So just doing some simple math, you divide by five, and that's how many miles away that strike occurred. So it's kind of cool that we can measure distance from lightning strikes based on thunder and how long it takes us for us to hear it. Now this is a map showing you all of the lightning strikes that are recorded on average from 2015 to 2019. And we're looking here in this particular image at all lightning types, whether it's in the cloud or on the ground. So lightning pulses per square mile per year. Now the lighter colors, as you can see on either coast, so like the light blues or the greens and the yellows are less lightning strikes, as you can see on the legend here in the bottom right. So not terribly many strikes per square mile. But in the central part of the United States, in particular the plains, the mid-Atlantic, even down into the southeast, especially down in Florida as well, that's upwards of like several hundred lightning strikes per square mile. So this is a really fascinating map that can not only show you where lightning strikes most frequently, but it also highlights, you know, where our thunderstorms form more often in the United States. And typically it's on the downwind side of the Rockies, again, down throughout the central plains there, all the way over here to the Appalachians too, we can see the effects of thunderstorm formation. And especially down along the coast too, when you have the influence of oceans or large bodies of water to drive and fuel thunderstorms, that will then result in multiple lightning strikes per square mile. So it's kind of cool that we are able to map that out and see these 20 to 25 million lightning strikes on average per year. So let's talk about lightning and how it forms. And it's actually a really fascinating process and it's multiple steps. So we'll go through each step. And step number one is talking about thunderstorm electrification. So that's the buildup of electrical charge inside a thunderstorm. So how does that work? So we know in the middle of a thunderstorm there is an updraft. It's a central column of air that is moving up through the middle of the thunderstorm and that updraft can actually pick up tiny little particles like super cool water droplets and ice crystals and even small hail and blast it into the upper parts of the storm. Now in the rest of the thunderstorm the effects of gravity take over and larger objects like large water droplets, snowflakes, and larger chunks of hail will fall down through the storm. Now this kind of creates a washing machine kind of tumbling effect inside the thunderstorm itself and these particles as they move past each other will collide and bounce off of each other and build up a static charge similar to like if you kind of rub your feet on the carpet and then touch a metal object or zap your brother or sister that same electrical charge is happening on a massive scale inside the thunderstorm so that's how we first get this electrification this build up of static within the thunderstorm itself now if we look at the big picture those particles are going to continue to move throughout the entirety of the storm. Now those lighter, positively charged particles, the ones that got the positive charge as a result of that collision, will move into the upper parts of the thunderstorm and even outwards into the anvil a little bit. Now the heavier, negatively charged particles that picked up that negative charge as a result of the collision will fall down into the middle to lower sections of the storm where they can kind of hang out and continue to tumble around or they'll even precipitate out the bottom of the storm towards the ground. That actually kind of builds up a little positive charge blanket at the bottom of the storm. But the big focus here is this massive buildup of positive charge in the top and this massive buildup of negative charge here in the middle. Now eventually those builds up of charge will become so big that they'll actually influence the charge at the surface. So we, if you've ever messed with magnets, you know that opposite charges attract and similar charges repel each other. So this buildup of negative charge here in the middle to lower parts of the storm will actually create a buildup of positive charge down at the surface. And then even in the outer parts of the anvil on the top of the storm, these builds up of positive charges will create negative charge builds up at the base. So we're getting the separation of charges and we're also getting a difference between the middle to lower section of the thunderstorm and the surface. So that's super important building into the next part here where we get what's called a stepped leader. Now what happens eventually is that negative charge building up in the middle section of the storm will become so great that it bursts through that little layer of positive buildup at the surface and starts streaking towards the ground. We know that the atmosphere and energy likes to be in a state of balance and so when that buildup becomes too powerful it needs to find a way to discharge and disperse all of that electrical buildup. 
So it will burst through that positive layer at the surface and start streaking towards the ground. And it's looking for the path of least resistance. It's looking for any kind of channel where it can make a connection with a positive charge to disperse all of that energy. And so this stepped leader that shoots out of the bottom actually kind of creates like a fork like structure as multiple branches are reaching out, trying to find somewhere to make that positive charge connection. So that is the stepped leader and down on the ground, we get the formation of what's called an upward streamer. So what's happening is as the, uh, as the stepped leader, excuse me, is coming down towards the surface, it's creating an attraction with a positively charged buildup at the surface. And so lots of positively charged tall objects like trees, buildings, telephone poles, cell phone towers, things like that are high enough and they have enough of a positive charge that they actually start to build upwards into the air. So they create upward streamers that are kind of reaching up from the ground, being attracted by the step leader that's on its way down. Now, eventually, one of these upward streamers is going to make the connection with the step leader on its way down. And that is the super most important part is when we get the connection between the step leader coming down and the upward streamer going up, that's when we get our return stroke. That's when we get the flash of lightning. So let me jump to full screen here so you guys can see this next slide really well. This is what happens when we get the lightning flash, the return stroke. And you can even see it in the right panel here. There goes the upward streamer down. Once it makes its connection, boom, there goes the electrical discharge. And fascinatingly enough, and I'll let this play again, even though the step leader is going down, and we assume more often than not that lightning strikes are coming down from the base of the thunderstorm, which is true, the return stroke that we see actually goes upwards from the ground. So it goes from the bottom of the connection back upwards to the storm. It just happens so incredibly fast that we can't see that upward motion. Instead, we just assume that the lightning is coming down from the base of the cloud. So it's kind of a fascinating fact that the return stroke, the lightning flash that we end up seeing, goes from the ground back upwards, which is really, really cool. Now, that's how lightning occurs when we get that connection between positive and negative charge, the negative from the storm and the positive from the ground. But we can get lots of different types of lightning flashes and discharges based on where these connections occur. So in the top left panel here, which I know there's a lot of flashing going on here, but bear with me, it's kind of cool. Uh, in the upper left hand panel there, you can see what we call in cloud lightning. And so the positive and negative charge connection is happening within the thunderstorm itself. So we don't see a lightning bolt. We just see the flash coming from the inside. So that's called in cloud lightning. Now in the top right panel here, you're seeing lightning bolts that are streaking between the central storm there and the other parts of the anvil and the base of the cloud there. So we're seeing these lightning bolts connecting from cloud to cloud. So we call that cloud to cloud lightning. Now in the bottom left hand panel, you can see lightning is going from the base of the storm down to the ground. Well, technically from the ground back up to the storm. So this is called cloud to ground lightning. So those three, the top left, the top right, and the bottom left are the three most uh, common types of lightning that we see. Now the bottom right hand panel is actually called an upward leader. It's a very, very rare form of lightning where it usually happens after an initial discharge of a lightning bolt, but you can see that tower there is actually sending a lightning bolt from the top of the tower back up to the storm. And so that doesn't happen terribly often. Usually this is a positively charged lightning stroke and they're actually quite rare to see. So I wanted you guys to see that video because yes, even though more often than not, it looks like lightning is going from the cloud down, even though we know the opposite is true, there are some cases where lightning actually goes back up towards the surface from tall metal objects or even from the ground, which is pretty fascinating. Now, up here on the summit of Mount Washington, things are pretty interesting because we're so high up in the atmosphere, there were only a couple of thousand feet from the base of these thunderstorms in some cases. And so as you can see in these two images here, we actually get uh, pretty close to or even on level with some lightning strikes uh, during the summer months up here. So on the left there, you can see we're looking off to the southeast. You can even see over the tip top house, Yankee building, some of the other structures up here, that incredible cloud to cloud lightning strike. And then on the right, looking off to the northeast towards Berlin, or Berlin, uh, you can see cloud to ground lightning here. And so lightning is actually a really fascinating thing to observe from up here on the summit. And I wanted to show you guys a video of a direct lightning strike that happened here when I was an intern a few years ago. And just so you can see what that's like. Um, so it's actually up here. Uh, the interesting factoid about lightning there. So when you're at home and you witness lightning, you see a flash, there's a couple of seconds, then you hear a bang. Up here on the summit of Mount Washington, it's actually quite different and a lot more of an alarming experience when you're directly inside the cloud where the lightning is coming from. So let me play you guys this video really fast here. Oh, God! 
So as you can see, it's a bit more of an alarming experience. It's this blinding white and purple light. And then it sounds like somebody's smashing a metal garbage can right next to your head. So it's a lot more of an uh, alarming, scary experience up here. Um, but since we're inside the building and we know that we're safe during events like that, and we actually do love to watch direct strikes to the summit during thunderstorms up here. So yeah, it is really cool and a bit different from what you guys might experience there at home. So lightning is cool. It's beautiful. It's fascinating. But it's also a bit dangerous too. So the other part of the presentation today is talking about lightning safety and what you can do to protect yourself in instances where you might be experiencing lightning or there's a thunderstorm approaching where you are. Now, before we dive into the do's and things that you should do in the event of lightning, let's get rid of some of the myths and things that you guys might have heard of before about lightning just so that we can clear the air and understand what's correct and what isn't correct. So first of all, if you're caught outdoors in a thunderstorm, and this actually happened to me and my Boy Scout troop a few years ago while we were out hiking in the Rockies, Crouching near the ground doesn't help you. Neither does running around in a fast circle and neither does flying flat on the ground. Actually lying flat on the ground is one of the worst things that you can do in the event of lightning. And so the, the rule of thumb is if you're outside in the thunderstorm, there really isn't anywhere that is 100% safe or much that you can do that will protect you in those instances, especially any of those three. So let's get those out of the way. Now, one of the more common myths about lightning is that it never strikes the same place twice. And that also isn't true. Lightning can and often does strike the same place multiple times over. One particular example of that is the Empire State Building, which is on average hit about 23 times per year. So it's you know, tall metal objects for sure, um, but just getting rid of the fact that lightning can strike anywhere, anywhere that it makes a connection with that upward streamer. Now, oftentimes people, especially at sporting events, they might hear thunder and they look up and see blue sky and think, oh, you know, I'm safe. The thunderstorm isn't in the area. I can't see it. That is absolutely not the case. And there have been multiple phenomena instances called uh, strikes from the blue where there are blue sky conditions and suddenly a lightning bolt comes down and strikes the surface, strikes water. Unfortunately, it can strike people in these instances. Uh, and that usually occurs when there's a thunderstorm in the vicinity where the lightning bolt just arced away from the storm. And that can happen up to 10 miles away or more from thunderstorms that are building, especially severe thunderstorms. So these from the blue lightning strikes happen a lot, especially in the plane system. So it's really important to understand that if you can hear thunder, that means you are within range of being struck by lightning. So anytime you hear thunder, even if you hear it softly, you really aren't safe in that particular instance. And one of the more fascinating facts about a lightning strike that I find interesting is that a direct lightning strike actually isn't the most deadly and isn't the most dangerous form of strike to a person. It's actually what we call ground current, which you can kind of see in this image here taken from a golf course, love the, the golf cart up there. But when lightning strikes the surface, the current actually spreads out kind of like an explosion. Sometimes turf gets blown up, um, but it's that outward spread of electrical discharge that is more dangerous to people, to livestock, et cetera. So it's actually ground current that is more dangerous than a direct lightning strike. So yeah, we get the picture, lightning is dangerous. So what can we do? How can we protect ourselves and stay safe in these instances? So let's talk about lightning safety in the outdoors first, because that's probably the most dangerous situation you might find yourself in when there's an approaching thunderstorm. So first and foremost, plan ahead. If you're gonna be doing anything outside, like playing sports, maybe going to the beach, you know, hiking in the mountains, things like that, have a plan or something that you know you can do in the event that lightning or thunderstorm is approaching where you are. And you can check forecasts, where that's the National Weather Service. If you're up here in our neck of the woods, you can check out our forecast product. You can check radar and satellite, which have lightning products, and develop a plan for your day to make sure you know what to do in the event that you find yourself in a dangerous situation. Again, if you hear thunder, even just a little bit, you aren't safe. That means you are within range of a lightning strike. And so when you, we have this saying in the business, as you can see on our sign here, and it's promoted by the National Weather Service a lot. And the saying is, when thunder roars, go indoors. And that's really honestly the best thing that you can do in the event of an approaching thunderstorm is follow that mantra exactly. So again, if you hear thunder, if thunder roars, go indoors. And in that sense, you want to find not just any building or structure, but something that's got four walls and electrical wiring and plumbing that can help disperse that electrical discharge into the ground safely. So things like gazebos and like three wall pavilions and things like that, tents, so on and so forth. Those really aren't going to protect you from a lightning strike. You need to be something inside of something solid that has wiring and plumbing to deal with that electrical discharge. And you want to stay in that location up until 30 minutes after the most recent lightning strike. And if I used to be a lifeguard for a long time, and this is exactly why pools will temporarily shut down and close, especially in conditions where it's like blue sky outside. When you hear thunder, it takes about 30 minutes or so for the storm to progress, move out of the range of being within striking distance. And so that also applies to coming out of buildings as well. 
during particular lightning and thunderstorm events. So that's the basics. Well, let's say, for example, you don't have a space that you can go to immediately. What if you're outside, like out hiking in the mountains, or if you're out in the middle of an open field or out on the ocean, what can you do? What if there isn't an indoor space that's immediately available? Well, the easiest thing to do is to start moving towards or finding somewhere inside a structure or even inside a vehicle where you can be safe. And you want to avoid the really tall, high up places like mountaintops or open ridges or tall hills that are going to put you higher up in the air so that your own upward streamer can make an easier connection with the downward step leader. So you want to be low down, stay away from tall objects like trees and cell towers, bodies of water like ponds and rivers and lakes, and you want to get down low. If you can find valleys or ditches or places where like a large forest of lower trees actually works okay, but the idea is you want to be heading down, staying low, and avoiding tall objects. And if you happen to find yourself in a group, which is what happened to my Boy Scout troop when we got caught out in that storm, you want to spread out. You guys want to separate yourself. So in the event that there is a lightning strike and there is ground current that goes out from there, less people are likely to be affected by that. And that is the absolute worst case scenario if you are caught out in the middle of a lightning event. But the best thing that you can do in that sense, especially if you're in a group, is spread apart from each other. So that's what you can do if you're outside. So let's talk about inside because, yeah, being inside of a building for the most part is actually going to keep you safe and protected from lightning strikes. But even inside, there are things that you need to be aware of in order to stay safe during a lightning event. So a lot of people, and I'm guilty of this, uh, especially when I was younger, you want to stay away from windows and your front porch, your balcony and open doors because that doesn't fully protect you from the inevitable lightning strikes. You want to be fully inside the building, away from windows, your garage, etc. Other things that you can do, don't use things that are plugged into electrical outlets. So no landline phones, no PC computers, no televisions or video games. Sorry guys, unless they're wireless, which is totally fine. And you want to unplug those things from the walls so that if your house does get hit by lightning, they don't get short-circuited or fried or any number of bad things that could happen. Don't take a bath. Don't take a shower. Don't be washing your hands or washing dishes. You want to avoid water or use of plumbing because the lightning charge can actually move through the pipes of your house. And so if you're using water and one of the pipes gets hit, it's going to discharge into that water and not so great things will happen. So avoid washing your hands and doing dishes, which is cool if you don't like doing dishes. Uh, and don't lean against the walls. Don't be trying to like view it in any other way possible. You just want to be in the center of your house away from the windows and doors and things like that. Other things that you can do is you can actually install lightning rods on your house and those lightning rods will be attached to a copper like grounding cable that will attract the lightning strike into the rod itself and it will run down into the ground safely and not even affect your house. And so it's always a good idea to consider putting lightning rods up here or some kind of grounding cable so that the electrical discharge just goes harmlessly into the ground in a way, which is really cool. So yeah, that's what's going on with lightning, uh, how it forms and how it propagates and some of the things that you can do to stay safe in those particular instances. Uh, a couple of things I wanna point out to you guys real quick, if I can figure out how to tap my screen here. <laughs> so let me go back to full screen. If you guys are looking for more information, you always go to mountwashington.org forward slash classroom where you can see our schedule and what's coming up here in the coming weeks. Uh, if you're going to be taking a look ahead, so next week, Tom is going to be talking about all the different types of thunderstorms that you can see, like squall lines and supercells and derechos and all these really cool, powerful storm systems that can build. And then even at the end of the month, when I'm back up here with you guys, we'll be talking about tornadoes, which is one of my favorite things to discuss. You can also go back and see some of the previous videos of forecast discussions and other deep dives that we've done. And of course, you definitely want to check out both the worksheet and the activity. So the worksheet for this week, uh, we'll be taking a look at lightning and lightning safety. So you guys will be learning about how lightning strikes and discharges and answering some questions based on that. And then what you guys have, might have seen me doing uh, right at the beginning here is actually your week's activity. So this is a really cool lightning game uh, where you can tap these little negative charge particles and keep them suspended in the air. And then you can tap one of these lightning bolts and actually cause a lightning strike to build up points. And it's learning about the attraction and the discharge between positive and negative charges and really great information like that. So hopefully you guys will check that out. It's a ton of fun and maybe you guys can beat my high score too. So yeah, that's all I've got for today. Uh, Jay, do we have any questions so far in the chat? Oh yeah, we got uh, Oh boy, I kind of figured we would. That's good. I like questions. Questions are good. What do we got? Uh, some of them you answered already, but it's good to go over them. So sure. Skylar would like to know how fast lightning can strike. Yeah, so lightning, so that step leader that's coming down actually moves at a rate of 200,000 miles per hour. 
Now the, re the return stroke, the actual lightning bolt that we see, can actually move at millions of miles per hour, 200 million miles per hour. So it's so incredibly fast, it happens in the blink of an eye. And these images that I showed you, especially the one of the stepped leader going down, we have to capture that with high speed cameras in order to see that at all, because um, otherwise it's invisible, you can't even really see it. So yeah, very, very fast. What else? Ava would like to know what the voltage of an average lightning strike is. Also in the millions, and actually I think I got this from my grandfather yesterday, we're talking about tens of millions of volts in any particular lightning strike, and that's in one bolt. You might have seen in some particular instances where lightning will kind of like strike and stay there and like flash, 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 flash. We call that a dart strike. So it's darting over and over into the same spot. And we're talking tens and tens of millions of volts. So yeah, impressive. What else? Julia would like to know how buildings are protected from being struck by lightning. So no building is ever really truly protected. Anything that is tall that develops a positive charge buildup and creates these upward streamers can be hit by lightning, especially buildings. But what makes buildings different is that they have electrical wiring, like copper wires and tubes and things like that, and plumbing, so like metal pipes that go throughout the building for your sinks, your showers, and your toilets and things like that, all of which are connected down into the ground in some fashion or to some kind of grounding cable which then runs into the ground. So when lightning hits your house, it's going to look for that path of least resistance, just like it's doing down through the air. And once it finds it, which is usually the wiring or the plumbing, it will run along that and then down into the ground, which is particularly good if you can get a lightning rod install, installed on your house. You're giving it a direct path from the lightning rod down into the ground to protect the rest of your house. So yeah, pretty cool. So uh, those two questions kind of lead to these ones, which you sort of answered. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina would like to know if a wooden shelter is safer than crouching on something insulated on the ground. And um, because you're talking about lightning rods, mm -hmm. um, exactly how does a lightning rod work and are they still used? Right. So uh, in any instance where you can be in a shelter versus being out in the open, it's going to be preferred. If you're crouched on the ground on an insulated surface, that might help you a little bit, but the insulated surface beneath you isn't going to contribute to just like breaking down the upward streamer that you yourself are creating. Now what's going to diverge that or stop that is the four walled structure you find yourself in. So if you find yourself inside of a wooden four walled structure, that's the best that you can do. Go with that option versus just crouching on the ground and hoping for the best. Uh, lightning rods are going to be used based on whether or not the people determine that they're useful for their particular building. Otherwise, they can rely specifically on you know the wiring and the plumbing of that building in particular. But we have a couple of lightning rods up here, do we not? Or do they uninstall them? I can't remember. Um, well, the building is coated with copper. It has it running throughout the building. Right, so. exactly. So we have copper wiring throughout most of the building, which basically anything, any direct strike that we get is going to find its way to the electrical wiring of our building and then down to the ground. So you might see them occasionally here and there, and they are helpful in the sense that you have that cable that will draw the lightning down around into the ground. But if you have plenty of wiring and plumbing, that also works too. And the radio towers are also grounded. <laughs> right, exactly. All of the 200 foot or the super tall radio towers that we have here on the summit are grounded to the, to the surface of the mountain as well. So we can disperse lightning that way. All right, we got time for one more. Cool. So this is a really cool one, and I wanted this one to be the last one. Great. Um, so we had a couple questions about the colors of lightning, mm -hmm. why they have their color, and uh, what makes them so unique. Right. So the color that comes from lightning essentially happens when through the process of what we call ionization. So when that lightning strike happens and heats the air around just like 50,000 degrees, the particles in the air are going to become ionized and kind of burn a little bit. Uh, most lightning strikes that you're going to see are some combination of white and purple. But if there are dust or other particulates in the air, you might get more of like a yellowish or even sometimes a greenish hue. Now, if you're looking at pictures in particular, that's going to depend on the type of film that was used for that particular capture. And the actual film is going to sh make the lightning flash show up in different colors like greens and yellows and sometimes even blue. So that's the other thing to pay attention to if you're just looking at pictures of lightning is what film was it taken on so you can kind of differ from there whether or not that's the true color of the lightning strike or if it's coming as a result of the exposure on the film. Uh, but really it's just if you're looking at a lightning strike and see a particular color, it's the ionization of the particles in the air and how they kind of burn in that super intense heat that will contribute to the lightning's color.
So fantastic questions. Thank you all so much. Hopefully you found this interesting. It's one of my favorite topics to discuss. Uh, and again, if you guys want more information, you can head to mountwashington.org forward slash classroom. Make sure you guys join us tomorrow for our forecast discussion at 1115. We'll be taking a look at the next 48 hours. We do have some interesting windy weather on the way in. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out going forward. And hopefully we'll see you guys there. So again, thank you so much for tuning in today and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks a bunch.